Hello. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see uh, so many students, uh, you know, excited by quantum gravity. Um, so let me start my screen sharing here. Uh, and, uh, okay. So I want to talk today about uh, <clears throat> local holography, which uh, is something that has happened uh, recently and provides um, a, a completely new, a new paradigm for, for quantum gravity. Um, so I'm not going to be very rigorous about citations here. So I'm, I'm just putting here the main actors of the of the field which have helped shape the the local holography to what it is today. It's still in, in development, and uh, you know there's some some people we are involved with the school like Mark Geller. Uh, um, and Etera Levin, I want to highlight also my longtime collaborator, Panzetti, and Daniele Panzetti, and William Donnelly. Uh, this field is also uh, related uh, um, you know, to other fields uh, that have been thinking about quantum gravity, not only loop quantum gravity, but also celestial holography, the notion of symmetry, and ADS holography. So uh, some of the work we do is, in fact, related to the work of these people that uh, you know, may be referenced to in the main uh, core of the talk. Uh, it's a lot to cover in one hour, so let's uh, buckle up and let's start. Let's see how much we can do. Um, so the, let me summarize it in some sense, what is the key idea of, of local holography? Uh, uh, oh, sorry, you see my screen. So uh, at, at its core, holography in general and local holography in particular is simply uh, the deeper expression of Noether theorem for gravitational theory. Uh, and we're going to explain a little bit more why uh, I'm saying that. Uh, and, and what local holography implies is that it implies an encoding of physical symmetries onto the corner of, uh, of the subregions of space times. And it includes uh, uh, in this description the presence of non commutative algebra at the corners that represents the quantization, the, the full, the true quantization of geometry. So the plan of the talk is, is as follow. I'm going to uh, um, you know, explain a very, in a short manner, summarize the main uh, aspects of Noether theorem. Uh, 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 I hope you follow the course of Mark Geller there. Talk about what are the holographies, the different type of holography that exist, uh, entanglement of subregion, and then focus on the corner symmetry algebra of einstein Hilbert and then einstein carton gravity and see how, in fact, it gives a completely you know, new perspective on, on loop quantum gravity. Um, so the first uh, uh, aspect, let me start with Noether theorem. Um, so Noether theorem starts by the, the choice of a Lagrangian L and uh, uh, then the use of uh, uh, bicovariant calculus. That is, we use a variational calculus delta, which is a field variation. And, and the Carton calculus D, which is a space-time uh, differential. So we have two, these two differentials. And, and what happens, the first uh, big result in this, in this field is that given the Lagrangian L, one can uniquely determine uh, its symplectic potential uh, called theta L here, uh, such that the variation of the Lagrangian uh, gives us the equations of motion plus a boundary term, uh, uh, which is the differential of this, uh, uh, of this symplectic potential. So the Lagrangian is a top form. Um, the symplectic potential is a variational one form and a co-dimension one space-time form. And the equations of motions are, are just variational one form. Um, so, you know, um, I would follow the example of einstein Hilbert. In that case, the Lagrangian is uh, the volume density, which is a square root of GD for X times R. Uh, um, and then uh, the symplectic potential is written there. It's a co-dimension one form. So here I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down what are the the dimension one form, which are obtained by contraction of a vector field of the top form, and, and essentially contains variation of the connection. So if you want to impose boundary, natural boundary condition for Einstein, but you will have to fix the connection on the boundary, not the metric. And the equations of motion here, I promise, as I say there, it's the one form, so it's just delta GAD times the Einstein, Einstein tensor. Okay, so here I'm emphasizing the, the the fact that uh, uh, the symplectic potential is uniquely determined by the Lagrangian. This is something that has been wrongly described in the literature by many, many authors. So it's, it's important to fix that. 
the, the choice of a Lagrangian uniquely determines the symplectic potential. And what that means is that there's a rule of covariance under boundary Lagrangian shift. So if you have two Lagrangians that differ by boundary term, they will have the same equations of motion, but they will have different uh, uh, symplectic potential. Uh, and the new, you know, for a new Lagrangian shifted by a boundary uh, one, the new symplectic potential is the, the old one times something which is a variation that disappear when I, I take another uh, variation. But there's also uh, an important term, which is the corner symplectic potential, which can be think, thought as, as the symplectic potential of the boundary Lagrangian. And this, this plays a role because it plays an important role because we're going to see then in fact this, this different, uh, this choice of corner symplectic potential means that it's not simply a change of boundary Lagrangian is not simply a canonical transformation. It might or it can change the uh, uh, representation of the, um, of the boundary symmetry algebra, the corner symmetry algebra. Um, Okay, so the, the first uh, law of Noether is the fact that the symplectic potential, which is obtained as the variation of the, you know, the symplectic form, which is obtained as the variation of the symplectic potential is conserved on share and satisfies the fact that this differential is proportional to the equations of motion and they will vanish on share. Uh, uh, you can call that the, the you know, Noether's zero uh, theorem, if you want. Uh, um, what it means though, is that the integrated symplectic potential, so you choose a slice sigma and integrate on it, uh, this uh, symplectic form uh, is not generally conserved when there are open boundaries there. So one example is that if you take a foliation of sigma t with corners, I'm going to refer to the two sphere at the, at the, at the corner of the, of the, the slice, you know, uh, as corners. Uh, um, uh, so if we take a foliation with corners sigma st, uh, and, and we consider a vector field psi, which is in fact uh, the time evolution vector field here with dt. Uh, um, we, we can see that in general, the, the symplectic uh, form, the integrated symplectic form, uh, um, you know, loses uh, uh, the time, you know, the, the, is not conserved in time. <clears throat> and if it's not conserved in time, it means that the corresponding theory is not really a unitary theory. And the, the, the leak of, of symplectic information, there's a leak of information through the open uh, boundaries. And the leak of information is controlled by this object F psi that depends on the Lagrangian L, which is uh, 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 called the Hamiltonian flux. So the, the symplectic flux here is the differential of the Hamiltonian flux. And the Hamiltonian flux is just the contraction of the vector field psi with the symplectic potential. It plays a key, key, key role in the theory. <clears throat> now, uh, the main aspect of Noether theorem is about symmetries, of course, and uh, um, we know that symmetries are invariants of Lagrangians up, up to boundary terms. So if I take a covariant Lagrangian and I look at a deformorphism transformation, uh, here delta xi refers to the field transformation. For instance, on the metric, uh, gravity delta xi is just the lead derivative of the metric. Uh, um, it's an active uh, transformation on the fields. Then delta xi of L is essentially the differential of the contraction of L uh, uh, alongside. Um, now, the difference between symmetry and gauge, which is the main theme of uh, our work, is very important. Uh, and what Noether uh, showed is that gauge symmetry implies Bianchi identities. And what this means is that if you take the, the uh, equations of motion one form and you contract it with a symmetry, which is a gauge symmetry, what you get is an object which uh, uh, is a total uh, uh, derivative. And this uh, argument of this total derivative is the constraints. Uh, what it means is that the constraints vanish on shell of the equations of motion. Okay, so for instance, in gravity, uh, if we take the contraction of the einstein hilbert uh, uh, equations of motion there with this uh, vector field delta xi, we obtain this term. And because of the conservation equation of the, of the Einstein tensor, uh, we can write it as a total differential, and that's the Hamilton, that's the Hamiltonian constraint, since it's what people call the Hamilton constraints, but here labeled by, by a vector field psi, uh, which is essentially the contraction of uh, uh, it's a three form, a co-dimension one form, uh, uh, given by the Einstein tensor and linear in the vector field. Okay, so the next aspect of Noether theorem is the fact that you can construct uh, Noether currents and, and Noether charges. The Noether current is uh, simply, simply, uh, simply obtained by contracting the, the variation of vector field along the symplectic potential. That's essentially where it comes from. And then there's a <clears throat> correction term 
uh, due to the Lagrangian there. Uh, the main theorem of Noether is that for gauge symmetry, this object is a pure corner term. Uh, what this means is that the current is in fact essentially the constraints plus a total differential. Uh, so the constraint vanish on, on, on shell, which means that the current is on shell uh, uh, trivially conserved, it's a total differential. And the argument of this differential is called the charge aspect. It's a codimension two form that you can integrate on codimension two spheres <coughs> uh, here. And so for instance, if, you, if we continue with our example, in metric gravity, they're, they're for the diffeomorphism generated by the vector flip psi, uh, uh, the charge aspect is the Comar charge aspects, and it's given by this formula. It's essentially the antisymmetric derivative of the vector field uh, uh, times the, 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 the co dimension to volume four. Yeah. So, what does it mean? It means that, let's say, if you think about time evolution vector, for instance, for a time evolution vector uh, field, uh, uh, you know, the charge associated with time evolution vector field is usually the Hamiltonian that generates time evolution. And the theorem of Noether tells us that the Hamiltonian is a corner term. There is no bulk contribution to it. The bulk is a pure constraint. And this result is the essence of local holography. In fact, it is the essence of all uh, the holographies that you have been uh, taught or witnessed so far. So what it means is that uh, in gravity, the key physical information about the 3D region is really encoded into its corner S. And essentially, one of the key information is the, the, the time flow operator. Um, now, uh, um, you know, there's more than just one vector field that, that you can put uh, there that, that generate this uh, charge. In fact, there's an infinite dimensional notion of symmetry group, which we call the corner symmetry group. And the corner symmetry group, which we're going to study, consists of all the possible transformations which admit a non-vanishing charges. Uh, uh, the transformation that are, uh, have a vanishing charge are pure gauge, so we can caution by them, but the ones which have non-zero charge are symmetries of the theory. Um, the last bits of, of Noether theorem is that uh, the Noether charge that we just defined is not always Hamiltonian uh, when there is open boundaries. So let's say if we look at a slice sigma here, uh, which is sometime evolution, this is the domain of dependence of sigma here, and the corner is called S, then in general, the, 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 what you look for is the contraction of the, sim the integrated symplectic uh, form with your transformation. And uh, being Hamiltonian means that this, this contraction is a pure, is a total differential here. And what you put inside is the Hamiltonian charge. Uh, in general, what happens is that if there's open boundaries, there's a possibility to have a flux. The flux that appear here is the same uh, object we already uh, seen in the non-conservation of the symplectic potential, the lack of unitarities, the Hamiltonian flux given there. So uh, what we have is that the Noether charge is Hamiltonian when the flux vanish. And uh, there's two ways to, to, for that to happen. Either we look at transformation where the flux vanish, and this is what we call the corner symmetry group. Now the, the, the symmetry transformation that uh, for which the flux do not vanish uh, uh, form what we call the extended corner symmetry group. And uh, we, we could try to make the flux vanish by uh, adding some boundary conditions. Uh, and in some cases, this is what people do. But in general, if we keep this flux there, uh, uh, the flux encode non-trivial conservation law. So uh, uh, the, the main, the main uh, uh, summary of, of, of this equation is, is, is the main summary of the Noether calculation is essentially that if you look at the variation, the transformation of the charges that are of interest uh, 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 under, let's say, vector field. So this, suppose that psi is the over dt, this means the evolution uh, uh, equation. Um, then uh, if there's no flux, we know that this transformation is given by the the rotated charge, okay? So this is one of the main uh, uh, theorem of Noether is that the, the charge is the generator of, of the symmetry, okay? If there is flux, there's an extra term here that plays the role of, of dissipation. So if the vector field we're looking at some, for instance, translates the sphere, uh, there's a non-zero flux and then there's a dissipation term. And this, this uh, generalized conservation law with dissipation is what formed the basis, let's say, of the memory effect. Okay, so this is all for, uh, uh, for the Noether theorem. Uh, the main message is that uh, symmetry charges are really uh, uh, 
non-zero at the corner, uh, including the Hamiltonian. So the information is included there. If there's no questions, uh, that's a good point to stop. I'll go with holography. So holographies, um, there are several notions of holographies that people have studied in the literature. The most commonly uh, um, uh, studied notion is uh, the notion of ADS-CFT holography. In this holography, uh, what we have is that the boundary uh, uh, is uh, asymptotic, it's put at infinity. It's also chosen to be time-like because it's in ADS. And um, this boundary is rigidly defined by a boundary condition. We impose a, a very strong Dirichlet boundary condition. And because of that, it does not allow outgoing radiation. So what it means is that in ADS-CFT, the system is closed. And, and because we assume that there's no symplectic flux on the boundary, it's also unitary by design, OK? Uh, but what this means, uh, uh, it means that there's no gravitational radiation, which means that, in fact, uh, what we're putting in an ADS-CFT boundary, this boundary condition is very restrictive. It, it forces the system to be thermalizing with its uh, radiation. And, and it prevents any form of dynamics. You cannot have black hole merger there. You cannot uh, explode a bomb inside your ADS universe. Uh, you know, there's no dynamics in some sense. It, it, it excludes any dynamical evolution in the bulk that produces gravitational radiation. So for that reason, uh, another concept of holography that I think is more interesting is, and you have heard about it, is the concept of celestial holography. Uh, what happens in this case is that uh, we don't impose in a celestial holography, we don't impose a uh, out uh, uh, um, restrictive boundary condition, we just impose a certain uh, fall off condition. And, and uh, because of that, the relaxed boundary conditions uh, in celestial holography, uh, celestial holography allows the presence of radiation, which means that the system is open and it allows energy and information loss through uh, 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 asymptotic infinity. Uh, a, a very important part about celestial holography, unlike ADS-CFT, is that it connects the real physical system, gravitational waves detector, and S-matrix observable. Um, uh, an implementation of, uh, there's an extension of celestial holography that they call null holography, where, where uh, you can also try to think about uh, how to encode the, the physical system, black hole merger, in the presence of the uh, of an horizon there, and not only follow uh, you know, the memory effect, these are the dumbbells that represents the memory effect at infinity, but also the flow of charges along the horizon. Uh, um, so this is uh, celestial holography is, is part of a more general notion of null holography, and null holography has a lot of in common with, uh, 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 with local holography. Now, the, the, the third uh, 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 type of holography, and this is the one I want to talk about, is local holography. Uh, uh, what this one does is that it doesn't uh, restrict, require any boundary condition. It also allows the boundaries to be at finite distance, like uh, null holography. And it requires, in some sense, uh, the choice of a co co Cauchy domain. So you, you're looking at uh, the time evolution attached to a corner sphere here, which in fact plays the role of the entangling sphere when you go from one domain to another. Uh, and here I've, I've drawn a, a section of that. And here, this is like a 3D version where I picture the domain of dependence uh, of that section. Now, what's important is that each holography is associated with a symmetry group. It's either the conformal symmetry group uh, for ADS holography, the extended BMS symmetry group for uh, celestial holography, or the corner symmetry group for local holography. Uh, and, and there's a precise sense in which uh, local holography is more general than local holography, which is in some sense more general than ads cft holography, in the sense that each time you go uh, down that direction, you relax uh, a boundary condition and you allow more uh, a boundary condition to, um, to, to flow through. Uh, and this can be shown, uh, and, and this is exemplifying the fact that the symmetries are in fact uh, including to one another. So, the, the, the theory which has the smallest symmetry group is ADS-CFT holography, which is conformal symmetry, which is included into uh, a form of BMS symmetry. And BMS symmetry is part of this uh, extended uh, corner symmetry group, as we will see. Um, so let me say a little bit more about the corner symmetry and how it relates to quantum gravity uh, um, and summarize what we have seen. So in gravity, the symmetry charge are supported on co-dimension two spheres. Okay, that's what we have seen. At the quantum level, what this means, it means that uh, 
this allows us to assign a corner symmetry algebra uh, to each uh, surface S here. We call it uh, uh, script GS or, or GS. So this is the, for the corner symmetry group. And this is a, a corner symmetry algebra, corner symmetry group that you can assign to every, uh, uh, any finite region of space. And we're going to characterize and study a bit more what is the nature of this corner symmetry group. Now, what happens is because, uh, uh, you know, this is a symmetry group attached to the regions of space, every observable, every type, every type of measurements, every type of operation you're going to do in your surface is in fact uh, represented as a, uh, carries a representation of this of this corner symmetry group. So we need, uh, uh, you know, classifying the representation of this uh, symmetry group gives provides a basis for the Hilbert space associated with finite regions. And and the main you know uh, uh, theorem, if you want, of this of this framework is the fact that Hilbert space here decomposes as a sum of irreps of the corner symmetry group representation and the label of the reps, you can think of it as some type of super selection sectors. Um, and the, the last bits that we're going to see more is that geometry is therefore encoded algebraically. Here, I'm not talking about geometry, I'm talking about symmetries and representation. And, and to do that, we first need to identify what is the corner symmetry algebra and what are its representation. Okay, so, that opens up to my uh, uh, third part, which is uh, uh, um, the fact that this corner symmetry algebra is absolutely essential if you want to understand the nature of entanglement uh, across subregion in gravity. Um, so le let's look at entanglement of subregion. So we suppose we assume that uh, we have a, a slice of space. Uh, uh, and we can we decompose this slice into sigma and its complement sigma bar, and there's an interface S between them. Now we want to understand what is the nature of the of the total Hilbert space associated with the total space uh, when I decompose it in terms of uh, sigma and sigma bar. So we're used to non-relativistic quantum field theory, let's say the basics of quantum information, for instance, or condensed matter. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, it's very simple. The total is but space uh, decompose uh, simply as a, a orthogonal tensor product of the subsystem. Okay, so the total is but space, the tensor product of H with H bar, H single bar, and, and the factors are orthogonal with the metric. So an operation here just you know has no effect on the operation there. Okay, so that, that's the, the most uh, trivial type of quantum theory. Now, in relativistic uh, quantum field theory. Uh, uh, as we know with the Rundle effect and the Hawking effect, uh, there's something really interesting happening and that, that picture is no longer valid. So what's happening is that now the input space is still, uh, uh, can be decomposed as a tensor product, uh, as a vector space. So it, it is still a factor of H sigma with H sigma prime. You know, we can have local operations which are independent on every every sector, there's no problem. But the new thing is that now the, the, this physical Hilbert space uh, are, are not orthogonal to each other. Uh, the scalar product does not vanish. And the fact that this scalar product does not vanish is the expression of the fundamental entanglement of subregion, or if you want vacuum entanglement. The fact that there's a unique vacua, but the relativistic vacua is maximally entangled. Okay. Now the third level of, of uh, connection uh, or entanglement comes from gauge theories. Now in gauge theories, what we have is that, and it's very important to appreciate, um, uh, what we have is that the total Hilbert space does not decompose into a tensor product. So we cannot write the total Hilbert space associated with the two region as a tensor product of H you know, sigma, the physical degree, and the uh, H sigma bar. Uh, um, the reason we cannot do that is because now we don't have one uh, vacua, we have infinitely many vacua. Um, that's one of the reasons. Uh, also what we have is that this tensor product, in fact, is, is uh, not only it's not equal, but it's strictly included into, into H. Uh, so why, why is that happening? Uh, the reason we're missing some states when we try to do that is because physical observable in gauge theories are non-local. So here I'm using a, a representation of a Wilson line as a physical observable, but you can do the same for gravity. It's just easier to describe like that. So 
Uh, what happens is that there are wheels, you know, essentially suppose that I have my big Hilbert space there. There's there's non, you know, non-local observable like this Wilson line going through there, which when I try to separate my space into two bits, uh, uh, are no longer gauge invariant observable, and therefore they cannot be written as as operator gauge invariant operator acting on here or there. And and uh, what happens is when you cut such an observable, some kind of boundary charge happens. So this is this is the main reason why. Uh, this equality is not true. Uh, so what it means is that, you know, the if you go from non-relativistic to relativistic mass CP theory, well, the vacua is more entangled. And then if you go for relative CP theory to gauge theories, then the level of entanglement gets deeper. And if you go from gauge theories to gravity, then it gets so important that you you expect that, that, that you have really uh, holography coming out of it. So what is the way uh, out of it? Uh, the way out of it is to introduce edge mode. This is the way out. Uh, edge modes essentially are, are uh, states of representation of the boundary symmetry. And what you do is that um, the first step is that you first extend uh, the Hilbert space attached to subregion sigma uh, by the naive Hilbert space plus something which is a uh, edge modes or boundary in that space or corner in that space. And this Hilbert space uh, carries a representation of the the corner symmetry group. And the step two is that now, if you want to reconstruct the, the total Hilbert space from its subregions, uh, what you need to do is take the, not the tensor product, but the fusion product. And the fusion product is something that uh, takes the tensor product, but isolate the singlets inside the tensor product on the GS. And that's the main uh, theorem here. Yeah. So what do we learn from that? We learned that the understanding the corner symmetry group and its representation is, is not optional if you want to understand the nature of quantum gravity. It is an absolute necessity uh, if you want to construct space time because it is uh, uh, the, the, the key element in the, at the core of the fabric of how you cut and glue back space time region. So, any theory of quantum gravity, no matter what it is, uh, should uh, uh, tell you what is the corner symmetry group and how to represent it. And if it does not, I would say, well, it's not really a valid theory of corner gravity. Now, okay, let's look at the uh, example of corner symmetry, uh, unless there's questions about that part. Okay, so let me go uh, a little bit, uh, okay, deeper uh, into the techniques and the nature of the corner symmetry group. Uh, uh, this is a work uh, that um, you know, uh, initially was done with William Donnelly there. Yeah. And, and recently we have been extended that or other groups have been extended that. So the question there is what is the corner symmetry group for einstein Hilbert gravity? The, 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 theory, the metric theory of gravity that we all know and, and, and love. Okay, so to understand its nature, um, we need to understand, so for the first thing is to understand that if you have a surface S, which is embedded in space time, uh, the tangent bundle associated with that surface is going to be, you know, it's going to decompose into a tangent component, tangent to the sphere, and a normal bundle for the, that contains the direction which are uh, normal to the, the sphere. And we can use this uh, decomposition to be a normal decomposition. Uh, uh, Technically, this means that we can choose a tangent coordinate. Let's call it with sigma a, the index a refers to tangent directions, and normal coordinates x i. Uh, we can assume that the sphere is located at the, at the location x i equals zero. Okay, and and now um, okay, we we have seen earlier that the the, the corner symmetry uh, um, charges are given by these Kolmar charges. So we can now. Uh, uh, do an exercise, and I recommend you do that as an exercise that will be the exercise for the talk for this school, is to uh, uh, find out what are the, the, the symmetry charge of einstein hilbert gravity. And the result of this uh, exercise uh, is that the symmetry, so by symmetry charge, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for all the charges, uh, 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 all the vector fields which have non-zero charges, okay? So it's, we are looking for the subsets of diffeomorphisms of M that possess a non-zero corner charge. And here they are. There is uh, a question, uh, That's the symmetry of, the, that's the corner symmetry. Sorry? There is a question, Noel. Uh, yeah. What is the degree of freedoms of the Hilbert space? Is it the matter field or the quanta of space-time? Uh, here it's a phase, here it's gravity. So it's the metric, um, it's pure gravity. 
Okay, so the phase space, it's the phase space of pure gravity. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm not going to talk about matter in that talk. I, you know, I can talk in the discussion that we include matter. But the symmetry group is going to be the same whether there's matter or not. That result is, is true for any theory of quantum gravity that does not have a deal at all. Okay, so it's absolutely any any metrical theory of gravity which is covariant and doesn't have a deal at all. It's absolutely uh, robust and generate. Okay, with matter, without matter. So, uh, what are the, the vector fields that possess non-zero charge? So, the, the first type of vector field here is Ya dA, which are vector fields tangent to the sphere that generates a diffeomorphism of the surface. Okay. Um, the second type of vector field that we have, uh, and they are called uh, in the literature super Lorentz. Uh, uh, and the area preserving uh, diffeomorphism uh, are called uh, often super rotation. So if you hear these names, they, they are part of simply a diffeomorphism of the surface. Uh, um, and usually the, the Virazo group that people study in, in, uh, in a synthetic infinity, it's also part of this, uh, of this uh, super Lorentz group. Uh, the second element is that we can look now at uh, transformations which are called super boost, which are you know, a, a vector field that transforms the normal uh, vectors, but they are vanishing on the sphere, okay? Uh, uh, and they are, they are the super boost. These objects, they form a, a, an SL2 or algebra at every point. The, the exponent S means that here I'm looking at maps from the surface to SL2, okay? And these two vector fields we can check uh, uh, do not have any uh, symplectic or Hamiltonian flux, okay? So they are totally Hamiltonian, if you remember the first part of the, of the subject. So this is, these, these two together form the coroner symmetry group. Now the third element of the, of the group, which is there, is the super translation that essentially translates, can allow you to translate normally the sphere. And it, uh, this group is simply a commutative R2S, uh, an R2 at every point uh, group. But this group carries, uh, carries some flux, okay? The super translation group uh, carries some flux. So if we put everything together, we can write down the uh, extended corner symmetry group, which uh, is the semi-direct product of D first times SL2R S. I put orthogonal because it's uh, orthogonal, it's a SL2R group associated with orthogonal transformation, normal transformation. And then there's the super translation bits here, which is R2S. You should really think of that group as the fundamental group of symmetry of Einstein and gravity in the same way that you think about Poincaré as the fundamental group of symmetry of relativistic quantum field theory. And then you organize everything, the classification of particle, the interaction, the fusion, the representations, the S matrix, the observable in terms of, of, of the Poincaré symmetry. Here, uh, this groups here, which is an infinite dimensional group, plays a, a similar fundamental uh, 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 role. Okay, uh, we can show that BMS is simply a subgroup. So I'm sure you have seen some talks by Andy or other people talking about a synthetic infinity and BMS is simply the subgroup of this group that preserves the null direction. Okay, so in BMS, you have a null direction. It reduces the SL2R to uh, just, uh, you know, a, a GL1 group and then it reduces the translation to be along the null direction. So we see that this corner symmetry group, you know, supersedes all other like, symmetry groups like the BMS. Now, uh, as I was saying, there's a subgroup there that does not contain any flux. So in some sense, there's a group that contains the group of super, that contains super translation, uh, contains information about the dynamics of the theory. But uh, we're going to uh, focus first on what are the label of the states at a given moment of time. If you take a snapshot of the symmetry, you should be able to label your state by representation of the, the subgroup here that I call the, the corner symmetry group of einstein Hilbert, which is diff S semi-direct product with functions valued into SL2R. Um, now, the main theorem of Noether is that uh, you have a gravitational phase space. That's what the question is about. And then the Noether theorem provides a representation, a canonical representation of, of this algebra of symmetry in terms of the gravity phase space. And, and this map that goes from the gravity phase space to the it's called dual of the Lie algebra in technical term is called the moment map. Uh, so to write down the moment map, uh, which is what we're going to do now and study a little bit more its property, we, we have to use, remember we use this coordinate where sigma is tangent, uh, xi is normal. And of course the metric decomposed into a normal metric, hij, a tangential metric and uh, a generalized notion of lapse. Okay, so there's a i goes from zero as two index and a as two index. 
Okay, so this is a general decomposition of, uh, of a metric around an embedded cosphere. Um, so we want to look at the representation, uh, uh, the canonical representation of the of the symmetric group. So the first bit is to understand uh, the DFS generator. So the DFS generator are labeled by this vector y a and and the charges uh, to charge aspect I call it p tilde a. The tilde refer to the fact that it's density code of q times p. Uh, it's a density on the sphere. And PA is the twist one form. Uh, it's a very well-known object in, in the geometry of null surface or embedded surface. And it has essentially, it appears uh, as uh, uh, the curvature of the normal map. So, you know, uh, zero and one refer to derivative in the normal direction. And because uh, V0 and V1, the laps are valued into uh, 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 they carry a, a vector index, then there's a natural bracket there, which is the Lie bracket. Okay, so that's the definition of the, of the generator. And then you can compute uh, uh, from, you know, the, the gravity phase space, what is the algebra of this uh, operator? And it, it shows that this algebra is non-ultra local and generate the diff uh, S algebra. So it's written uh, down there, here. Um, the details don't, don't matter. What's important maybe here is that there's some derivative involved. In it. Okay, the, the second part of the, of the group is the uh, uh, SL2R generator, the, the super boost generator, which also are written as integral over S of uh, NIJ contracted with the, the label of the vector field, uh, WIJ. The, the, the object there, N, in fact, is the normal two form. And um, if you write it in components, this n tilde ij, where well, it's a density, so you can do the square root of q, but essentially it is the metric, it's component of the ma normal metric. Okay, epsilon ij is just the symmetrization tensor, uh, you know, uh, normal symmetrization, anti-symmetric tensor. So, uh, so essentially in ij is the, is the normal metric. Uh, um, and what this means is that we can now compute the algebra and we can, we can try to compute what is the, you know, the algebra of this normal metric component. And uh, a nice way to do that is to introduce an SL to our basis and define NA to be simply NIJ, you know, contracted with the, uh, tau, the, 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 the matrix uh, tau A, which is a basis of SL to R. And you find that this uh, normal metric, uh, normal two form, normal metric components satisfies a, a, an SL to R algebra. Okay, so NIB is epsilon ABC and C, where uh, this metric here, the, the metric has signature uh, minus plus plus, because it's a cell to R. So the Casimir of this algebra, and that's a very, very important point, is that the Casimir of this uh, 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 normal cell to R algebra, which is given by N0 square plus, you know, N1 square plus N2 square, is the determinant of Q, and it's strictly positive. Okay, because the Q metric is supposed to be a, a Riemannian sphere. So that's the definition and the characterization of the moment map, how we go from the gravity phase space to the, to the representation of this symmetry. So now, if you want to do quantum gravity, we have to understand, well, what are the representations of this symmetry group? And, and essentially, uh, understanding the representation starts by understanding what are the Casimirs, what are the labels of the representation. If you want to understand this U2 representation, you know that they are, they are classified by, you know, Casimir spin J, okay? Uh, and then once you have the Casimir, you can understand what are the labels of the states here. But we're, here we're going to focus on the Casimir. Now, what's very important is that this condition that the sl 2 Casimir, uh, which is the determinant of the metric is strictly positive, means that the sl 2 representation attached uh, to this uh, uh, normal metric belongs to the continuum series. And as a consequence, this means that there is no quantization of area in Einstein Hilbert quantum gravity. Okay, and that explains somehow the tension maybe between people working in Einstein Hilbert gravity and loop gravity, because uh, uh, they, they never really saw any quantization of area. And there's a good reason for that, is that it does not happen. Okay, but still, you know, there's still a very interesting. Uh, uh, so quantization of area is not necessary uh, for a theory of quantum gravity. That's the first lesson we have there. Um, um, but there's still a very non-trivial uh, representation theory. Uh, to get really the, the Casimirs, what we have to do is that we have to use the momenta here and take some anti-symmetric derivative of the momenta. 
I think of the momenta as being a, the moment of a fluid leading on the two sphere, this, this would be the vorticity. And then because I have internal degrees of freedom, there's also an element of the vorticity that comes from, from uh, so this would be like the vorticity is like the angular momenta part. And then there's a spin part, which comes from the internal degrees of freedom. So if you take out this combination and here you have, trust me, there will be exercise number two, it's much more involved. Uh, than exercise number one, then you can show that this object um, uh, satisfies uh, an algebra, which is the area preserving diffeomorphism algebra. It's the algebra of, of diffeomorphism that preserves the, the, the measure square root of two. Okay? And accordingly, from there, uh, uh, you can construct the Casimirs. There's an infinite set of Casimirs of this algebra, which are labeled by an integer n, and they are given by in the integral over the sphere of uh, uh, the powers of this uh, uh, generalized vorticity, okay? So that's the sets of Casimirs. And what's very interesting is that we can list what are the first few Casimirs of this algebra. And the first one is when the power here is zero. And it means that the area itself is a Casimir. And that's a good news because we know that we want the area to maybe be a label for how many states there is in the theory. So, you know, one necessary, a condition for that to happen is that somehow the number of state is is a solder to the to the area of the surface at some quantum algebraic level. And here we see that the the first one n equal one is the not charge, so it's a natural uh, uh, charge of symmetry that people identify, uh, which which measures the non-triviality of the bundle or uh, the normal bundle. And then uh, in higher the higher one like C two is something that people studied a lot in, uh, in fluid mechanics. It's very important if you want to understand the weather system because the weather is on the 2D sphere and it's called the fluid entropy. And it, it points out towards an interesting analogy between quantum gravity and, and, and quantum fluids. Okay, uh, I think that's the, the end of that section of uh, understanding the corner symmetry algebra for uh, uh, for Einstein Hilbert uh, gravity. Um, the last bit of my talk is that now I want to uh, connect uh, local holography with loop gravity and, and, and show you that, uh, uh, in fact, local holography allow you to uh, put uh, um, some results of loop gravity now in a completely covariant uh, uh, manner, which is compatible with our usual knowledge of field theory. Okay, so uh, just to let you know, Laurent, uh, normally you still have five minutes before questions. So, I mean, okay, I may, I may need just 10 minutes. Okay. I think since I'm connecting with loop gravity, that the theme of the, of the theories might be important to understand that. So, um, okay, so uh, yeah, I want to I want to talk a little bit about Einstein Carton and loop gravity. So. Maybe you had talked about it. Loop gravity, what, what's happening? Loop gravity is based on the quantization of, of Einstein Carton formulation of gravity, that is, in terms of a frame field and a connection. And it's very important that it's, it's done in the presence of a so called immediate parameter called gamma. <clears throat> now, uh, loop gravity usually uh, uh, makes two postulates. First, it postulates a fundamental discreteness of the geometrical excitations, that is, uh, uh, it assumes that all the excitations in the field are supported on graphs, which are either embedded or not embedded, uh, but there are some kind of extra discrete structure. And, and this assumption uh, makes it, somehow makes loop gravity kind of unpalatable to people who are not, who are used to continuum field theory living in space time. And, and, uh, and, and this discreteness uh, is, you know, the discreteness of support. It's the same discreteness that appears in people that do causal sets or, or dynamical triangulations, kind of uh, discreteness postulated from the onset that you want to, at the end, eliminate, okay? The second point it does is that it imposes a, a fundamental breaking of, uh, of internal Lorentz symmetry uh, uh, by using a time gauge and, and using the Ashtekar barbero connection. And then, okay, the nice thing about loop gravity is that from this result, is it derives uh, uh, um, from these assumptions, sorry, it derives the fact that the area spectra uh, uh, is discrete. And, and the fact, which in fact is a sign of the fact that the geometry is quantized and the gap of the area is proportional to gamma. So in the limit gamma equal to zero, we recover, let's say the usual metric gravity 
the, the, the gap uh, disappears. So it's consistent with what we were establishing earlier, that there's no area gap in, in Einstein in blood gravity. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, as maybe you could have told from my uh, account, these first two points are already not satisfactory to my taste. I don't want to postulate fundamental discreteness or, or graphs or excitations which are ad hoc. And I don't want to break internal law and symmetry. I don't think it's necessary. And, and the theory of gravity should respect law and symmetry. And this is essentially what we can do now with local holography. We can finally derive the main result, which is area discreteness uh, uh, with a gap proportional to gamma without assuming any graph discreteness and law and symmetry break. So let me uh, summarize that we do that. And this is the work done with uh, Mark and, and Daniele Ponzetti. Uh, um, so we start from Einstein uh, Carton uh, uh, with the old term. So Einstein Carton formulation is, uh, depends on the frame field EI, which is the one form value into a vector, you know, internal vector space. And from there, you construct a two form here, uh, uh, which is EIJ, which uh, it contains uh, uh, either the dual of EI and EJ, where the duality is just a, you know, epsilon tensor on Intel and index. Uh, and then it contains uh, eventually an additional term, which is where this immediate parameter uh, enters. This is called the old uh, term. Uh, and the Lagrangian uh, has this very simple BF term, which is the contraction of the two form E with the curvature of the connection omega which is uh, supposed to be an independent connection. Now, if we take the limit gamma goes to zero, when the limit gamma goes to zero, uh, uh, one recover the second order formulation, the limit gamma goes to zero means that there's a term in the action becomes infinite. So the, 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 you have to, you know, the term proportion, the operator proportional to it has to vanish. This means that omega has in fact to be the spin connection determined by E. And then if you plug that back in there, you're back to, uh, in that limit to the usual uh, formulation of gravity. Uh, um, what's happening there, uh, uh, and something quite subtle, is that the, the symplectic potential of Einstein Hilbert and the symplectic potential of uh, Einstein Carton, who is the old term, differ by a corner term. And as we already mentioned in the beginning, this means that the new, char new charges get activated at the quantum level. And, and uh, charges that are trivial in uh, Einstein Hilbert are now non trivial in Einstein uh, Carton. Hilbert. And in particular, the new charge, which is non trivial in Einstein Carton, is the Lorentz charge. So there's a local Lorentz symmetry, which is not there in gravity, because of course, in, in, in Einstein, uh, in metric gravity, Lorentz symmetry is trivially implemented. We are working in some sense at the, at the trivial representation of the centers. And so the, the corner symmetry group. Uh, of Einstein Carton Hilbert has now this form, diff S is always there. This is the universal factor. And the semi direct product factor uh, contains an SL2R, but it's an SL2R attached to the, to the tangent metric, not the orthonormal metric. That's why it was the symbol. And then there's the internal SL2C, which you would expect, because this is why we introduce frame to have a, you know, the SL2C symmetry uh, represented. Um, so, if we go, uh, just give you an insight about what is the moment map there. Um, so the, the gravity phase space contains variables such as the normal metric. So let's say you have a slice and you, you choose a, a normal to that slice and, and uh, associated the normal to that slice, you can construct the internal normal, which is normal contracted along the frame field. So that's part of the gravity phase space. A very important variable, which is central to a loop gravity is the flux. So the flux is a two form uh, uh, here, uh, uh, but uh, projected along the normal. So it carries only a vector index. And then the third uh, element of the phase space is the SL2, is the, is the tangential metric that we already had in metric gravity. Um, so the new part of the group, as I was saying, is the boost factor. So, um, you know, we can construct from this gravity phase space variable, what is the Lorentz charge aspect? So that is the, 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 the generator of symmetry of SL2C. And it's written like that. It contains the, the anti-symmetric product of uh, the flux with the normal. And then um, the immediate parameter enter into the, the spin. So when you take you know, one over gamma to zero, let's say then uh, you, you kill the spin factor and the Lorentz algebra becomes. Um, 
So the important result there is that you start from the gravity and then you, you compute the symmetry and you find that this uh, uh, flux here, and this is a result which is valid in the continuum. There's no need to assume a graph or some discrete structure. Um, and what matters is that this uh, uh, flux terms satisfies an SL SU2 algebra, an ultra-local SU2 algebra, and the non-commutativity is proportional to gamma. So again, you know, when gamma equals to zero, uh, this commutator vanish and this uh, flux becomes abelian. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that the tangential metric, which was commutative in Einstein-Hilbert gravity, now becomes non-commutative and it, it forms an SL2 algebra. And again, the commutativity is proportional to gamma. Okay. The important point here is that when we compute the SL2 or Casimir. Uh, um, the SL2 R Casimir is in fact mine is opposite to the SU2 Casimir, which means that the SL2 R Casimir is, you know, contains a negative sign, not a positive sign. And if you remember when the SL2 R Casimir is positive, it means that the quantization of SL2 R is in terms of uh, uh, continuous series, but when SL2 R Casimir is negative, it's in terms of discrete series. And this means that in that theory, because of the presence of gamma, the area spectra is discrete. So in the continuum, what we have is that the measure, instead of being a continuous Lebesgue measure on the sphere, it's a discrete measure, uh, which is uh, given by the sum of points where the measure is non-zero times the Casimir of SU2, uh, a delta function and proportional to gamma. And this is somehow the, uh, how we get discrete area spectra from the discrete SL2 series. Um, and the local uh, Lorentz invariance is, is completely built in this, this representation. There's no time gauge whatsoever because the normal is part of the phase space. Um, so this is the last slide of the main talk. It's just a summary here uh, of some of the results. So the, one of the main results we have seen is that the presence of the symmetry algebra allow you to understand, you know, what are the, uh, you know, what are the commutation relations of the, of the metric components, okay? So if I give you a metric in quantum gravity and I impose the constraints, then the, the metric components are gonna be non-commutative. And this is what we have revealed. We have seen that uh, the, the, the normal metric here from an SL2 algebra uh, uh, represented into the continuous series, the tangential metric here from another SL2 algebra, which is represented into the discrete series when gamma is, is not zero, and the diffeomorphism are, are encoded into this uh, uh, lapse function. So all the elements of the metric now are accounted for and, and embedded in, uh, in, uh, as generator of this symmetry algebra. Uh, as we have seen, you know, different gravitational, classical gravitational theory with the same equation of motion might lead to inequivalent quantization. einstein Hilbert, you know, does not have quantization of the area element. And therefore, is an equivalent to uh, you know Einstein Carton Holst with the Holst term, which does. Uh, but in, in all cases, what this the corner symmetry algebra we have is a is a semi-direct product of the uh, diff S uh, algebra times a Lie algebra, uh, you know, value into the sphere there. And what's important is that the Casimir of this Lie algebra is essentially proportional to the metric. So it means that the way you classify representation of the sphere is by choosing the nature of the measure on the sphere. And this measure could be either continuous, uh, like continuous Lebesgue measure, like in the case of Einstein Hilbert, or a discrete measure, like in uh, Einstein Carton. And, and if the measure is discrete, you get elements of, that were before discovered by loop gravity in a very discrete context. And this is my last slide. Uh, um, this is just the summary of the results. Um, so what I want to tell you and what I want you to remember is that any, what we have established here is that any physical observable inside the region sigma, such as the density matrix, the correlation function or whatnot, organizes according to the representation theory of the corner symmetry. And what this means is that the least we can do in order to define quantum gravity and the, its subdivision property is to understand what are the unitary representations of this corner symmetry group. And we have seen that there's a universal structure to this corner symmetry group uh, as a semi-direct product and the, that the key element there is the area measure. What we haven't discussed is the you know, matter that was in the question, but also the dynamics. And the dynamics uh, as 
I briefly mentioned earlier is equivalent to charge uh, conservation. It's encoded into the representation of the extended corner symmetry group, and it can be implemented or it should be implemented at the quantum level in terms of the fusion, the fusion principle. Thank you. Thank you very much, for, uh, Laura, for, for this talk. If there are questions, I will allow the participants to unmute themselves. So I, I do have a question. Um, you have said at some point that um, there was no quantization of area in Einstein, but uh, gravity. But then uh, you've uh, argued that the spectrum of area was discrete. So I don't really understand. Uh, to me, it's a bit confusing with respect to my, my so, visual knowledge yeah. of loop quantum gravity. Well, so what, because I was careful to distinguish, so a theory of quantum gravity depends on which Lagrangian you're working with. And uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian, uh, um, you know, leads to an inequivalent quantum theory to the Einstein Carton uh, with the old term. And, but we, we know that from the beginning, we know that the discrete, the area spectra is proportional to gamma. Right, the emergency parameter. So in the limit where gamma goes to zero, which is when you recover Einstein Hilbert, there is no uh, uh, there is no discrete spectra. So we already knew that the limit gamma goes to zero eliminates the, the discreteness of the area spectra. All right. Okay, I, I understand. Does that answer? Right. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah Thank you. Yeah. So here I, I'm saying that. Uh, yeah, parameters like the Emirzi parameter have a physical uh, uh, significance and you can, you can prove it in the continuum. Um, there's a question yes. about which one is yes. physical then? Well, then that's the thing you need to uh, link. Uh, uh, this is a you know, observation that's going to, to determine that. So you need to link the presence of this parameter to physical observables. Um, and uh, and let uh, the experiment uh, decide. Uh, so one physics, I mean, yeah. It is, you know, the, va the value of the emergency parameter, it's a low energy parameter of our theory that is not yet experimentally determined. It could be zero, it could be one, it could be 20. Uh, we have to find a, a physical observable, you know, a, a design experiment. There are some uh, uh, to measure it. As a the question original by... definition of the graphing is the, the CFT. So if you want to get a CFT or if you want to get a boundary theory, you first have to kill all gravitational radiation. I hope you understand that. So 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 it's only once you 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 kill the 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 the, the, the gravitational radiation which kills every dynamics in the boundary that you 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 reveal a CFT. So here. Uh, you can reveal CFTs and in the context of, um, of uh, celestial holography, people have seen that there's some, some, uh, some CFT like degrees of freedom, but you should really think about quantum gravity. It's not the theory of a CFT. I'm, I'm sorry, because a CFT, you know, contains only one metric if you want, whereas quantum gravity is going to allow superpositions of metrics. So at best, if you want to go back to the CFT, it's going to contain uh, uh, superpositions of CFT. Uh, now, if you if you pick a particular boundary conditions, then you can reveal uh, uh, the, the 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 theory that uh, if you pick a particular boundary conditions, now the flux you kill the the, the symplectic flux on the boundary, and then the charge are going to be conserved, and then essentially uh, the theory uh, 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 that you're going to reveal is the theory that uh, preserves the conservation of charge. That theory depends on your boundary condition. That's, so there's as many CFTs, if you want, as, as you can pick uh, boundary conditions. I hope that answers. So here it's, it's more general. We, we're talking about the general framework of quantum gravity that allow arbitrary uh, uh, gravity fluctuation. Uh, so can I- There was uh, also a question point? initially where, in, uh, recent model where the boundary is coupled to external dissipative system. 
So I didn't mention that in EDSCFT. Of course, people recently realized if you want to understand um, Hawking radiation, well, you cannot do that in the context of usual holography. So you have to somehow destroy that perfect boundary and, and couple it to external system. But, and that's, that's in line with what we're you know, proposing. Uh, I would say, if you do that, it's great. And that's where it should go. But you're outside of the context of usual holography. Like it's no longer you know, Young Mills, SUN. Uh, I mean, and then you, you better start from scratch and understand maybe like uh, what we do or like uh, what uh, 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 I would recommend that, you know, it's maybe a, a better way to use this concept of local holography to understand, you know, what type of degrees of freedom on the boundary you should activate to really open the system. All right. Thanks. No, that was the first point that I mentioned. And the second point is also, I guess, uh, what you were saying about having a superposition of CFTs. Um, so again, what they have found in, in this uh, work with JT gravity is that, uh, uh, you know, you have this factorization problem and that seems to suggest that uh, the gravity theory is, is dual to an ensemble of CFTs mm -hmm. rather than a single CFT. So, I mean, is, yeah, is that, yeah. is that no, so, something so that what you're in some sense I was, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. So what I was saying when I was talking about ADS-CFT, I'm talking about, because I think there's a split in the community, I'm not part of it, but I'm talking about traditional ADS-CFT that proposed that it's uh, quantum gravity is super young means and equal five, which is one theory, and it's unitary, etc. Now, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like it, it, I think this, these results that you're doing is people who are, we were starting from ADS-CFT and then realizing that first there's no dynamics and then there's a problem with factorization. And that was my, but, you know, and then that was my, my second point. My second point is that you cannot avoid, if you want to talk a, a, about, about quantum gravity, understand what is the nature of subdivision of regions, right? And, and understand that there's a symmetry group that governs that instead of maybe trying to pile up on, on previous construction where that symmetry group is not manifest. I would recommend backing backing down and revealing that uh, symmetry group then to rebuild. Um, well, I think Florian has a question, but uh, uh, after his question, I would want like to follow up about the ADS CFT dynamics. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what happens when the Bianchi identity T are not satisfied, then it's not a gauge symmetry. I mean, it's, it's a usual symmetry. So then none of what I say applies. Then the charge is a bulk charge and there's no, you know, there's no holography. Okay, and that was, that was a quick, quick, quick answer. So, so if I may, if I may just, just uh, you know, uh, raise a point about what you're saying that uh, the CFT on the boundary cannot describe a superposition of metrics. Uh, I mean, or, or it cannot, or, or because the boundary is frozen, you cannot describe dynamics. Uh, I, I mean, like we have like so much work showing that, you know, for example, you can model things like heavy ion collisions, uh, you know, um, yeah, no, there's, there's a collection of work. Yeah, I agree. There's a collection of work. I'm talking about quantum gravity dynamics. It's really, and in fact, my the goal of my talk is not to talk about ADS CFT, is to say ADS CFT for me was useful. It brought some ideas that gravity is holographic. But, you know, I think the new understanding is that the, the symmetries which are behind quantum gravity are much richer and bigger, and, and we should study them for their own sake. Uh, and there's something universal about it. So, um, it's, you know, yeah. I think it's kind of a new beginning. You know. uh, it's not postulating the answer, it's trying to, to, to find the answer from the, from the, the central elements. Um, so it's kind of a different perspective. There's some link, as you just said, in the very recent works about factorization and radiation. This one connect, and there's, there's definitely link into you know, with, with uh, a celestial holography, which is about understanding dynamical systems and radiation. So there, there the link is, is, is clear. There is a question by Etera. If you are reading it, or Etera, you can also 
do physical Ask body it. removals? Yeah, uh, Laurent? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I can say my question. Uh, I was wondering, uh, are actually, are you saying that all the bulk observables can be written as uh, part of the corner algebra or that maybe both physical observables, bulk observables and boundary observables are both a different representation of the same corner algebra? Yeah, it, it, it's more of the second. That is, that is the, because the corner, the corner symmetry algebra it's kind of a snapshot of, of, of the symmetry. So it, it's like everything you do in the bulk is going to organize itself as a, uh, in terms of representation of the corner symmetry algebra. Now, uh, you know, proving holography is going beyond that. And, and proving holography is now trying to understand what happens when you move the system and you go away from this, uh, I would say this more, you know, what I was describing in, in this talk is more kinematical and then understand the process of, uh, of producing radiation and distilling radiation out of your of your region, um, and we, you know, the conjecture is that this uh, uh, this at the quantum level in quantum gravity, the process of distilling radiation or distilling radiation is is done in terms of fusion. So, so uh, yeah, so it, it's it's the latter. Okay, so so far, uh, and I was hopefully precise on that. That everything. Uh, is organized in terms of the representation of the corner symmetry algebra. Uh, if, if I'm not uh, asking too many questions, can I ask one more about uh, the general program? Yeah, uh, sure, go, go ahead. So, I mean, I mean my, my point is that, like, so what you're looking at are uh, the classical, the symmetries of the classical theory, right? These corner symmetries. And, uh, and, and then, you know, you, you're quantizing them and you, and you find that uh, yeah, there's a discrete area spectrum. Now. My, my point is just that like, why do we like, why should we expect quantum gravity to have precisely the same symmetry as a the classical theory? Like, uh, you know, I mean, isn't, isn't this akin somewhat to, uh, you know, what Jacobson once said that, uh, you know, you can't hope to quantize uh, hydrodynamics and expect to find uh, a phonon, right? I mean, it, hmm. it, am I, am I? Okay, let me, let me take that as a challenge because in fact, uh, uh, Elando quantized hydrodynamics and found the, and found the superfluid. So, I think I think that is a bit too naive, but let, let me go back. I think, um, yeah. So so you're right. Here, what I'm looking at is that we you know we don't know what uh, how to quantize the system, and I'm taking a very conservative point of view, which is, okay, well, uh, uh, and the assumption is that uh, whatever the symmetry I'm identifying there, uh, which is really the the symmetry that follows from uh, general covariance for background independence, has to survive in some form uh, at the quantum level. So the, 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 the first things to do is that in general, we don't know how to quantize system unless they are symmetric. When they are symmetric, we can say, well, let's postulate that the quantum system uh, um, preserves the symmetry, right? And that, that's, that's a very, uh, um, that's a very, I don't know, um, a strategy that has paid for every system we know to quantize. In fact, it's because of that. We identify symmetry and then we quantize the symmetry. So, you know, it's an hypothesis that somehow uh, at the quantum level, uh, quantization usually does not uh, destroy symmetry. You know, there's very uh, few examples of that. What, what, so what quantization might do is uh, deform symmetry. So an example of that is integrable systems. I mean, an example where symmetry, let me take, uh, let, let me take back. The, the program uh, I'm, I'm advocating here is, is akin to the program that was developed in the late, uh, 80s, early 90s, of classifying all possible phase of quantum matters using representation theory of the conformal group. Okay, so people realize that that there is a symmetry, which is a classical symmetry of phase transition, which is conformal symmetry. And then, if you use that, uh, you can postulate that all phase of matter are, are in fact uh, obtained by representation of this of this symmetry group. And that became extremely uh, powerful and useful up to these dates, right? So the 
de, de, de virus or to the symmetries, the, the you know, dominant tool to organize quantum phase of matter. So this is kind of the idea. The idea is that here, this corner symmetry group should play the same role as what CFTs uh, played no, for but, uh, quantum theory. Now, the, no, but, but I mean, I mean, then just to, you know, the, the counterpoint is that uh, you have the existence of quantum phase transition, right? And, and those are not necessarily described by conformal field theory. So you have an exception to that picture of critical points being described by conformal field theory. Now they always carry a representation of, of the symmetry group, whether it's broken, whether you can always talk about your- No, but, I mean, no, but the point can... being that- Yeah. That uh, you, you, you know, quantum systems which have quantum critical points would fall outside this classification based on representations of the conformal group. Okay, we, okay. They, they, but to go back to gravity, the, the, the main point is that if we have a symmetry, we have three options. Either the symmetry survive quantization, which is what happens 99% of the time, or this symmetry is a, is a dynamical symmetry and it's implemented in a deformed manner or dynamically at the quantum level, uh, uh, which, uh, which is the case of integrable systems, uh, which involve maybe all the rest of the systems we know. And then, Option number three is that the symmetry is broken. And I would say if the symmetry is completely broken, then we don't have any handle onto, onto the theory and then the problem is hopeless. But uh, what we're revealing now is that we're revealing an infinite dimensional symmetry group that people haven't studied. They haven't classified the representation. They haven't done what we have done for CFT, understanding the OPEs, the dynamics, uh, all of that, which no matter what you could say, uh, the paper of Belavin, Polyakov, Zamolochikov, they revealed the symmetry, you know, uh, created a, a humongous boost in, in quantum, in quantum phase, I mean, in the study of quantum uh, systems in condensed matter, uh, which we still see the ripple effect of it. So I think we need to be a bit more humble and say, well, okay, there's something that we completely ignore uh, and we have to look at gravity uh, with that lens. The advantage of looking at gravity is that length is that I don't have to talk about geometry anymore, or postulate what are the points. I, I can talk about quantum gravity into an algebraic manner in terms of uh, representation, fusion. I can, I can create a different, uh, the geo, if you want, different classical uh, dictionary that gives a completely new perspective into quantum gravity that we haven't tapped in. I'm sorry, I have to uh, 